Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to World at War Comics. My next special guest is Mr. Alex Segura, comic book creator, writer, novelist, and a lot of other things, too. Alex, thanks for being with me, man. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. This will be fun. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, likewise. Uh, I'm very excited. Uh, so, I mean, I've known of your work. And then when Dick Tracy came out, you know, growing up, not that I was a huge Dick Tracy, but I did uh, get to read a little Dick Tracy when I was younger. My parents, you know, always wanted me to read. Um, and I really enjoyed kind of that, that those kind of crime uh, series. And when Mad Cave came out and I saw that you were on that title, I got really excited. And through five issues, it has been spectacular. Um, so congratulations on that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I know it's uh, like we were saying before we start click record. It, it's been a long time coming. And I think Michael and I are just happy to have the opportunity to tell the story with some runway, you know, especially in this marketplace where, you know, everything's a one shot or a mini series to have some legs on this has been a blessing. And uh, we're, we're just so proud of the work. Geraldo is really just gone next level with his artwork and the whole team yeah. is really great. It's, uh, it's something we're we're very proud of. And, and we're, we're appreciative in the moment. Sometimes you you're like, oh, man, I wish I'd really... Uh, appreciated something while I was doing it a little more, but this is something that, you know, we're savoring it because we, it took a long time to get here. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. Well, before we jump too much into Dick Tracy, I would love to kind of go back a little bit, talk about your history, how you got in the comic books. I know journalism was a big part of your life um, before really getting into the writing scene. Obviously, you, you've you had quite a few amazing novels um, in that crime noir with Pete Fernandez. I, I would love to know how you kind of got into that writing side. I assume it's uh, related to journalism, but where did this passion for writing? and storytelling start in your life and was there one person maybe that kind of pushed you in that area or encouraged you um i've had i've been blessed to have a lot of inspiration and mentors and different people that have nudged me along um i've always been interested in stories i read i've been a reader since i as far back as i can remember i don't remember a time that i wasn't like pouring over a book or a comic um i started with archie then quickly evolved into superhero stuff I was a big Spider-Man head, Batman, X-Men, especially um, very much into stories like Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie and mysteries and the classics, but also a sci-fi reader, like a big Star Wars and Star Trek fan, and also a reader of those novels, like the media tie-in novels, um, which I thought were super entertaining. And it, it kind of, you know, scratched that itch that was already, you know, the comic book reader, like of working within an established universe and adding to a mythos, I always found that fascinating. So even as a kid, I was coming up with my own stories in, you know, Marvel or DC, like Batman stories, Spider-Man stories, X-Men stories, while also creating my own characters. Um, but as to how I got into comics, yeah, journalism was my background in college and as an early professional, but I was also an English major in college. So I, I knew I wanted to write and I had taken some creative writing classes and, um, it really turned into something when I first decided to kind of blend journalism and comics. And I started doing some freelance writing for places like Newsarama. And eventually I worked at Wizard, which doesn't exist anymore in any recognizable form, but was once a huge power in the industry. It was very much like the tastemaker oh, yeah. in comics. Uh, and so I was there as an associate editor, and that really was my first industry job. So I went to conventions. I got to meet a lot of pros in person as opposed to over email. Um, and then I went back to work uh, at newspapers in Miami. And then eventually I started out as a publicity guy at DC. And that was, a, I was there for a long time. Uh, but I always knew I wanted to write. That was always something in the back of my mind. So I think it was at DC where I really started to get more into mystery fiction and novels. And, you know, when comics became my career, I started you know, reading these novels for fun is kind of a distraction. And um, I and then I got the idea of, well, let me try and write one. And um, that was my hobby. And sometimes your hobbies become your careers. And it's a, really a blessing to to have it be my career in some ways. Um, so I wrote my first Pete Fernandez novel while working at DC. And then it was published in 2013 when I had come back to DC after a stint at Archie. Um, and that's really what kicked it off. I had, I had also written a few comics things. I wrote a short story story for DC's Halloween special in 2009. And then I'd written a bunch of stuff at Archie, like um, a few classic Archie stories, but also Archie meets Kiss. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually Archie meets Ramones and the Archies and things like that. And um, it, you know, it all kicked into higher gear, I guess, 
um, more recently, but I've, you know, I always joke, I'm like the, the, the 10 year overnight success, you know, not, you know, everyone's like, Oh, well, secret identity really, what, what a great debut that was. And I have to remind them that it was, it's my seventh novel. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, can you talk about, uh, Pete Fernandez and that entire series? I think you're up to five, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah. It's a quintet of novels. Um, yeah. it really started, like I said, I was reading a lot of great PI novels like Laura Lippman's work, George Pelicanos, Dennis, Dennis Lehane has a great PI series, Walter Mosley. And what really I took away from those books was that they were steeped in setting. They were really strong in place. Like Baltimore was a character, DC, New York City uh, in the Matt Scudder books or, or, you know, outside of Boston for Dennis Lehane. Um, so I thought, why is there one for Miami, which is where I'm from? And obviously there were, I just didn't know of them yet. But that kind of hubris, like the young hubris really pushed me to write my own and to really portray a character that was messed up and flawed and not this invincible Jack Reacher type. No offense to Jack Reacher. It's just, yeah. you know, some I, I'm i drawn to flawed characters that, you know, you're kind of woven into their backstory and you kind of follow them along uh, as they develop. Um you know, and, and Reacher is much more like the ultimate hero, which is very cool action hero type thing. But um, for me, it was more about like, how can I explore this character's faults and, and go through an arc, a character arc with them? And so by the end of the series, you know, not to spoil anything, Pete has gone through a very meaningful journey and kind of accepts what his destiny is, which which looking back now is a big theme in a lot of my work, just people overcoming their flaws and, and, and uh, experiences to achieve what they've been destined to do whether they knew about it then or but have realized it now so um it was it was a great experience and that's really where I kind of made my bones as a novelist and as a writer you learn about plot and character development and b plots and subplots and uh you know cliffhangers and um I really treated the peep books like a comic book in that there were cliffhangers at the end of novels which some people yeah. don't like but I like as a reader because it propels you to the next one and um I didn't shy away from spoiling what happened in the previous books in the current book, because I thought you're either going to love this book and be intrigued enough to go back and read it, or you've already read it and it's just a recap. So, um, you know, I, I didn't shy away from treating it like a series. Like it's, yeah. you read, you should read them together because that's how yeah. I read them. Mm -hmm. And and what did uh, Pete Fernandez and that series lay as a foundation as now you're into Dick Tracy. Is there anything that you could bring over in your style of writing to Dick Tracy that you have done? Yeah, I mean, um, I think the idea of noir is really overused in terms, it's just a marketing term now. Like now anything is noir, like Care Bears That's noir, and then it's noir. <laughs> but the definition of noir for me is, you know, a story about messed up people making emotional choices and then being painted into a corner where they have to get out of it or resolve it. And usually they can't. So Dick Tracy and the Pete Fernandez books have noir elements. I wouldn't say they are noir because the protagonists are heroes. Mm -hmm. You know, Dick Tracy, uh, we're not going to kill Dick Tracy. Yeah, spoiler yeah. alert. He's not going to die <laughs> anytime. But it is going to be something where he questions his decisions and he has to face a certain level of darkness and evil um, that is potent and scary. And uh, I think for Pete, it was very much about him crawling through the wreckage to get to something more, more acceptable to him or better, a better place. Um, so that's the overlap. I think, you know, I think Tracy is much more established, obviously, like Pete is a newspaper reporter when we meet him mm -hmm. and he's not exactly up in fighting shape. You know, he's an alcoholic. He's, he doesn't have a great reputation in with relationships or his friends. Whereas Dick Tracy is almost like Superman in a yellow trench coat. He's a good yeah. guy good cop he means to he wants to do the right thing he i i, I talk michael morrissey and i morrissey and i talk about this a lot that he's not really batman in a yellow coat he's much more mm -hmm. like superman he has a code of conduct he's a good guy he doesn't want to break the rules but he will if he has to if mm -hmm. if right supersedes the rule you know he's yeah. not just a rule follow, to follow the rules and i think that's the question we we pose pose for him in that first arc like what yeah. happens when this infrastructure you've revered shows you some cracks and some flaws? Like, do you then just kind of accept them and do what you're told? Or do you question yeah. authority because the right thing is supersedes that? And so that's, that's been his struggle. But um, 
overall, I would say Tracy's flaws are a little different. You know, he's obviously been haunted by his experience in the war, mm -hmm. but he doesn't have the same demons that Pete would have. Yeah. So it's yeah. there, which is good. I, I agree. I mean, it definitely came through in those first five issues of Dick Tracy, and he ends up having to kind of question authority, which, like you said, he's very aligned with and, and very respectful too. But when he knows that something is not uh, right, he has no problem going across or above that in order to make it right. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, that's absolutely incredible. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it's definitely, it's, uh, I, I'm glad people are, are oh, there you are. Uh, yeah. I'm glad people are responding, <laughs> responding to, to the arc we've given Tracy, because it's also, I think the challenge for newspaper strip characters is that they don't have the same kind of ongoing continuity that something like Batman or Superman or, or Daredevil has where, you know, people have consistently been exposed to these stories. And so yeah. there's a, we, 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 we try to stick more to consistency over continuity because there really isn't Dick Tracy continuity. There's yeah. the newspaper strip, which has been going on for decades, but you know, that's also very challenging for new readers. So we're trying to yeah. kind of take the elements we like and make sure that the character is identifiably Dick Tracy, yeah. but also play, be as creative as we can be with how these characters are introduced and portrayed because new readers are coming here and we want them to, it's a different iteration. It's yeah. not, it's not just jumping off the newspaper page, which is not yeah. bad. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And it still has that same like and feel. I mean, mumbles, flat top. I mean, you still have everything that you would want in a Dick Tracy, but it is a little bit more modern. And uh, I kind of like it. I mean, I, it was a blast going through those first five issues. And I'm glad that oh, it's something you. that's that's ongoing, too, because we do get a lot of um, kind of short series, five, six part series, which fully understand. I feel like that's kind of the especially outside of the big two, that's where a lot of publishers like to be in that sweet spot, right? Small arcs that they could come back to every single year, move it into a trade. And then obviously outside of the U S and Canada, that's kind of what runs comic books is more of that trade omnibus as opposed to U S where we're very floppy driven, but I love a good run too. And I'm kind of glad that this is something that seems to be going on right uh, above and beyond. I mean, we've already seen some of the covers on Mad Cave for issue six and seven. So we, yeah. we know that it's not stopping anytime soon. We hope that it continues. Yeah. We hope we can uh, keep on going as long as they'll have us and it, it's doing well enough that it's sustaining itself, which is good. And yeah, the market is what it is. It's a challenge for new stuff to break through. The benefit is it's a recognizable IP. Like a lot of yeah. people know Tracy. So the challenge is really on us. Like how do we create a story that resonates with people and, and, and pushes you beyond just identifying something, but also wanting to buy it. Yeah, no, couldn't agree more. Well, I'm all in, Alex. I, I've loved Thank it up you. to this point. So I'm definitely ready for some more. Um, can we get into some of the news that just uh, um, came out as well? And I don't know if, how much you could kind of talk to it, but, you know, we just had um, New York Comic Con. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, you were there, right? I was there. Yeah, I had a table. Yeah. Like exhausted but i am <laughs> excited to be here but yeah definitely my brain if i'm like stumbling over words a little bit it's because i've been yeah. talking nonstop for like five days and into from the morning to the night and so my yeah. brain's a little synapses aren't firing as quickly as they should <laughs> fully understand um before we jump in can you kind of talk to us how it was um you know as far as the experience um any anything that you took away from new york comic-con from a fan perspective what were people having you sign like all that good stuff it was great i had a table in artist alley l10 with uh, rob hart who's a novelist and also we've co-written some novels and, and comics together blood oath most notably in dark space which just came out a sci-fi novel that's basically star trek yeah. meets john Le um I thought the buzz was really good. Just speaking, I couldn't, didn't really walk around that much. That's the one drawback to having a table in our alley. You, you kind of walk around when you are on the way to the bathroom or going to get food or going to a panel and you see people and you say hi. Um, but I think we, we had the first early printings of the legendary links collection, which is a offshoot of secret identity. Secret identity uh -huh. is a murder mystery set in comics and it has comic sequences. Yeah. So we took those comic sequences and expanded them into a full graphic novel that Mad Cave published. Um, we had a significant amount of copies and they were gone by Sunday morning, which was great. Oh, wow. And we had a huge response to Dick Tracy. We had a lot of the single issues there. People bought would come in and buy the set, which was great. We had a lot of, I saw a lot of traffic for Battle 
of Jakku, which is the new Star Wars um, maxi series I'm writing for Marvel, and people seemed really excited about that, and Spider Society as well. And, um, and lots of buzz on the question, which is coming out next month in a few weeks uh, from DC, yeah. which will which will star Renee Montoya on the Justice League Watchtower. Um, and, and just continued attention for Secret Identity and anticipation for Alter Ego, which is coming out in December. Nice, nice. Um, the other one that I wanted to talk about is the question. I think that was um, some big news that came out of uh, this time there. Can you kind of talk about that? I mean, I feel like this is another character right up your alley. Oh, yeah. I joke around that I'm, I'm just doing uh, characters in colored fedoras from now on. Dick Tracy. <laughs> and, uh, we've got a, a Green Hornet series with Miss Fury coming up at some point. Um, the question, I love Renee Montoya. She's my favorite DC character. She's just fascinating to me. She's complicated. She makes mistakes. She has demons, but she's also got this great legacy to live up to in, in taking over the question for Vic Sage, who's also still around. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so when we find her at the beginning of all along the Watchtower, she's at a relative low point. You know, she's lost her position as commissioner of Gotham. Her personal life is kind of a mess. And so she gets this very bizarre opportunity to come onto the Justice League Watchtower and basically serve as the sheriff of the station. You know, um, very Deep Space Nine, Odo vibes. She's kind of walking the Watchtower and making sure that this haven that the heroes have created is that is safe for yeah. them and is a great place for them but she's also brought in because there's this undercurrent of menace something is going wrong on the watchtower nobody can figure it out they know renee has the ability to figure it out and so they bring her aboard but she can't do it alone so she's built she's given actually this team of supporting players that basically make up a team for her of friends acquaintances uh, and more. Um, and we talked a little bit about that on the panel on Thursday last week, uh, the DCP Gotham panel, and we got to show some pages. Um, Kian Torme is the artist, and he's just killing it on the book. Him, his art paired with Ram Fajardo, who's doing the coloring, uh, is just next level. It looks beautiful. Um, I'm really blessed. And they're taking a very widescreen approach, but it's also very gritty and noir and just grounded. It, you know, it feels very... I love the contrast of, you know, the wonder of superheroes, but through the filter of something very human and grounded. So we're seeing it through Renee's eyes. And that, I think, makes the color and wonder of the DC Universe pop a bit more. So that's been fun. Yeah. And if I read correctly, this will be a, a six part series, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah six issue mini. Nice, nice. And will it be um, through the Black Label or no? No, it's in continuity. It's one of the oh, audience books. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, cool. yeah. I mean, with all in, I mean, we've obviously had some big changes um, in writers and artists moving around a little bit with all in. Um, we're starting to get our, our first few issues of all in. And it seems like so far, there's quite a bit of excitement around that. I don't know if you felt that while you were at New York Comic Con around DC with obviously you got the absolute, which has exploded, but then you have all in where I think there's a lot of excitement about uh, where uh, DC is going. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's great. I mean, I read Absolute Batman. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I'm excited to read Absolute Wonder Woman. I love everything Kelly does. And Hayden mm -hmm. Sherman to me is like, I met him on the panel and I always admired his artwork, but it just like how he can draw in so many different styles and do it so well, so masterfully is really impressive. And, and the art on Absolute Batman's really got this manga influence that I can't, maybe I'm misspeaking, but it's just... um just brings this different flavor to Batman that I had never experienced as a longtime Batman fan. And Scott's voice being back in Gotham is always a treat. Um, yeah. And the all in stuff is exciting. I mean, how can you go wrong with Wade and Dick? And excuse me, Dan Moore on Justice League. It's just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. I mean, I and think Dan... still coming, like seeing the new Aquaman news was really exciting. Yeah. It was a big fan of Arthur Curry. Um, I really loved what Leah Williams has been doing with Power Girl. So seeing her continue there has been great. Uh, I'm excited about Teen Titans by John Lehman and Pete Woods, two, two pros that just, you know, it's going to be solid and very good. Um, and Pete's art just keeps leveling up. And, you know, I feel honored to fit into that. And having Batgirl by Tate looks fantastic. I've, I saw some of those pages at the panel and I was just like so excited to be just part of that wave. You know, you're just yeah. part of this great wave and hope that you catch fire as you're doing it. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. As a longtime DC fan, we've kind of gone through quite a bit of changes over the last few years. So yeah, yeah I, I'm really enjoying this one. I, I love kind of the, the shakeup that they did. I, I think sometimes you just need that as a, a company and and maybe in, in, I would love your perspective, even as a writer, you know, when you're on, you know, Tom was on Nightwing, I think for four years, that's an amazing yeah. run for anybody. And it doesn't happen that often. Like when I grew up, you would have a writer that would be on a title for a hundred issues easily. And these days it doesn't seem like that happens that often. And Tom had it quite the run on, on Nightwing. So I don't know from a writer's perspective, if you kind of like those kind of changes, if it's needed at some times in your career, um, or do you kind of like, man, I'm, you know, this has been such an amazing run. I don't want to let go. What, what would be your thought on that? Yeah, I think as a writer, especially in the marketplace now, you have to assume that you're going to get that opening arc and everything else is gravy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Tom Taylor and Bruno on Nightwing, this has become the exception more than the rule, which is just, yeah. you know, the market, I think readers need stuff to draw their attention. So it's usually like a new number one, a new creative team, an artist, artist change or big storyline. And that's fine. But yeah, I, I kind of long for the time when a writer could kind of buckle in and say, I'm going to be here for a couple of years and I can lay some foundation. I'm a fan of subplots and, yeah. you know, the Claremontian method where something is dropped in issue three and then it doesn't get resolved until issue 24. But every reader is different. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of people want to see what's new and, and are drawn to what's new. And that's that's fine, too. So from a writing perspective, it just means you have to hit a home run out of the gate. You have to come in and and Pour, it, pour your heart into it and hope that it works and then hope that you get another arc or you hope you get another chance or opportunity. So it, it's a little bit more of a front loaded challenge, yeah. but you know, it is what it is. That's the market. So you have to just kind of adapt to the market. Yeah. No pressure, Alex, but yeah. your, uh, <laughs> your, your issue one needs to be perfect. So we can continue this, right? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it should be compelling no matter what, even if you know, yeah. I'm going to be on here for 50 years, that first issue needs to pull somebody in and, and get people committed, no matter what runway you get. We didn't, we know we had the same kind of pressure with Dick Tracy, even though we knew going in, we'll probably get a second arc. We knew that if we didn't nail the first issue, it wouldn't matter, you know, because yeah. people wouldn't have been bought in. So yeah well i can tell you on issue one you come out with a bang man <laughs> uh with that that scene in the restaurant which kind of sets the tone for the next four oh, yeah. issues but yeah, yeah mm -hmm. i don't want to spoil anything if you haven't read dick tracy man this is the title to jump on but right Thank out of the you. gate man it's it's not the dick tracy i was expecting when i got into it because i've read a lot of no, dick we went tracy. in hard you went in hard, man, and I loved it, man. It's kept me hooked um, for these first five issues. But uh, yeah, I agree. I do think that's kind of needed, right? You, you got to come out with that bang. And there's so much competition. I feel like we're in the, I don't know if you call it the golden age, but it feels like on the indie side of the business, there's been this explosion, um, which in a good way, we're getting all kinds of unique and diverse titles um, mm -hmm. there's something literally for everybody. Um, and then growing up, right. It was really just DC Marvel image obviously made their splash in the nineties and the market kind of crashed at the end of the nineties when everybody thought they were going to send their kids through college by picking up, uh, you know, all these, uh, these comics. But, uh, man, I feel like now with what Mad Cave is doing, um, what Ghost Machine is doing, it's just a really fun time to be a comic book fan because you just have so much, um, which I think puts a lot of pressure on the two, the big two, right? Because they got to do some pretty unique stuff because there's just so much more competition. At least that's how I'm seeing it from a fan perspective. I don't know from a writer perspective if you see it that way. I think there's a lot of diversity in storytelling, not just superhero comics. Like if you yeah. love comics are a medium, you know, it's not yeah. a genre, not just superhero comics. There's slice of life comics there's sci-fi comics, horror comics. We're seeing that a resurgence in horror comics. You know, there's romance comics. I think it's a new golden age in terms of diversity of content, which is good. I think yeah. you, it all have to be capes and tights. I love superhero comics. So yeah. I'm immediately drawn to that genre as a reader because it's yeah. what I grew up with. And I think even there, you're seeing a lot of variety, not just from DC and Marvel, but from Image and Mad Cave and other places that are giving you these different twists. So yes, I think the challenge is higher in terms of if you're a publisher, you have to really hit you know have to do great because there's so many other wonderful options that people can gravitate towards they don't yeah. they're not locked into just reading your stuff but i also think that marvel and dc have stepped up in really cool ways i think mm -hmm. they're taking unique approaches to really core characters like i'm really fond of the superman books lately the batman books i really you know i was a huge fan of the krakoa stuff and i think from mm -hmm. the ashes stuff that's 
taken over has been really interesting. Like, you know, particularly like David Marquez's art on Uncanny X-Men is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And there's just so many like fantastic books coming out. And you mentioned Ghost Machine. I think they're doing really solid, like grounded hero, pulp hero type stories that I find fascinating um, from creators, you know. So yeah. um, and it's not just all comic shop market stuff. There's there's stories that really appeal to the book market and there's stories mm -hmm. that appeal to web comics readers. So I think if you're interested in comics, there's not been a better time in terms of yeah. finding a comic for yourself. You know, there's there's no limits on the kind of stories you can find. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then obviously on the other side, right, we have manga, which has exploded in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and I think they're doing quite a good job of having that kind of diversified storytelling um, from mangas that are based on basketball and <laughs> to, uh, you know, crazy things like Chainsaw Man and stuff like yeah. that. So I, I think that also helps on the U.S. comic side, I think, from a creative standpoint, realize, man, there's a lot of stuff that we could do within this medium that maybe we haven't tried before. And it feels like manga has done it. I don't know if you feel that same way, too. I mean, I walk I into I mean, Barnes and Noble. Number one, manga's a number one seller in in, yeah. in period, you know, yeah. so they they dominate the book market. And I think what, what publishers should probably glean from that is readers want big chunks of content, compelling content for a low yeah. price point. And that's hard to do you know, you, you need to pay the talent, you need to pay yeah. people for doing the work. But I think the return is potentially high. And so you see these long running series, 10, 15, 20 volume series where the collections are like 400 pages, you know, re the readership is there. It's a matter of presenting the kind of stories they want to read. And so that's the thing, you know, I always look to the leader of the pack and see what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but I do think that, you know, the American comic book market is still very vibrant. I just yeah. think it's not it's not just comic shops. I love comic shops. I go to my comic shop every week with my son and we we grab our stuff. But I think there's also other places where where people are going to get their comics fix like Webtoon or Tapas yeah. or places like that or or the bookstore. You know, mm -hmm. there are a lot of trade waiters and that's fine too. It's just, you know, how do you cater your stories to appeal to as many markets as possible? That's the challenge. Like how how does this fit in for a single issue? But then how is it going to work on a trade? How is that trade going to work for digital readers? How is it going to work for vertical scroll? There's not everything, one thing that's everything to everyone, yeah. but you want to check off as many of those boxes as you can. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good point, Alex. Um, anything else that you're kind of working on that I haven't mentioned um, yet, Alex, that fans of yours and to kind of be ready for or anything you're allowed yeah. to talk about? Yeah, for sure. Um, I've got a one shot coming from Marvel in January. It's part of this Galactus. What if Galactus named X character or his Herald? And I get to write the Moon Knight one with Scott Eaton, who I've, I've been a fan of his art for a long time. But that was a fun, fun mix of like street level vigilante superhero stuff, because I, lo I love Moon Knight and particularly the Mensch uh, Sienkiewicz era. And like cosmic wackiness, like, uh, you know, I think I think if you're a fan of like the 90s Marvel cosmic stuff, or even classic uh, Moon Knight, you'll dig it. Um, Battle of Jakku is going on for a while. It's a twelve issue series. It's coming out every two weeks, so it'll it'll it's a little bit of a tighter schedule. But that has been a huge huge project, and it's been so fun to play in such a in demand period of the Star Wars universe. I think people have been really clamoring for that story to be told and told through the eyes of the main characters like Luke and Leia and Han. And so that's been a huge honor and a huge privilege to work with people like Leonard Kirk and Stefano Raphael and Jethro Morales, plus the, you know, the crack editorial team at Marvel have been so instrumental on, and, you know, the question, we talked about it a little bit, but I really hope people dig that first issue because it is, it is a mystery in space, uh, not to reuse the DC title, but um, it is very much a deep, dark mystery uh, being unfurled in this place where you think nothing could go wrong because you're surrounded by superheroes. But evil finds its way in anyway. Um, Alter Ego, my next crime novel, hits in December, and I'm excited about that. It's it's the standalone sequel to Secret Identity, which won the mm. uh, LA Times Book Prize a couple That's years right. ago. And in November, we're releasing the Legendary Links collection, like I said, which is the expanded mm. comics from Secret Identity. Very much in-world, very meta. We're treating it like this lost comic book story that Mad Cave is printing for the first time. And... Uh, what else? I feel like I'm forgetting something. Spider Society is still going strong. Issue three yeah. comes out this week, yeah. uh, tomorrow. Well, I don't know. What this is, I don't know when this is going on, but but it's it's coming out this week. 
And it's it's all building towards a big battle between between the Sinister Squadron and the Spider Society, which has very much become like this ragtag group of spider heroes. Like, um, yeah, the Sinister Squadron comes in and basically takes out all the big guns. They take out Miles. They take out Gwen. They take out Jessica Drew. They take out uh, Madam Web. And so she well, they they knock out Madam Web and, and they kind of mess with her power. So she's then forced to put together this team of like ragtag heroes to just on the off chance that they can beat this new villain, which, which we've revealed in issue two, we, we got her to take off her mask, but we'll, you know, I'll save that for people to read it. <laughs> That's awesome, Alex. Well, Alex, I want to be super respectful of your time. I know that you've had a, a very busy last five days. You're probably yeah. exhausted and tired of talking to, about comics, but uh, man, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate having the time. I hope we could do this again, especially as we get closer oh, sure. to to the question. I'm a big DC guy, um, so I can't wait to to get that into my hands. I'd love to have you yeah, come back. Yeah, please let me know. Let me know what you think. I, I hope you dig it. And uh, no, it's always, I, I, I could talk about comics all the time, anytime. So <laughs> uh, it's it, the only thing is, just, yeah, my brain is a little wiped, but it was a great convention and it's always great to see the readers like the, these are the people you write the stories for and the people that come up to you and say this was awesome i had a great time reading this that's that's what keeps you going yeah well i appreciate it alex i'll make sure i put all the links for everything that we talked about today to make it super easy for fans to follow all the stuff that you're working on right now um, but until next time alex really appreciate your time have a great rest of your week and uh, we'll talk soon thanks so much tommy take care yeah you too You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.